si no son, bueno, no, pero okay. lo explicamos. There you go. Okay. There, can you hear me there? Yeah. Yes, now you can hear me. Hello. Uh, this is a tough spot after lunch, but thank you, thank you very much for being here. Um, as you know, we're going to be starting with the lightning sessions. This is going to be like a block of lightning sessions. You're going to hear very interesting presentations within 10-minute uh, time slots. And, um, and we look forward to starting with ours, so, because we are a little bit over time. And uh, so the first project that you're going to be listening is uh, an initiative of the Open Education Consortium, which is the OE LATAM. And this initiative is with the intention of gathering a community of leaders of the Open Education Consortium that are working specifically in the Latin America region. And we are fortunate to have two of our representatives here, which is Marisol Ramirez from Tec de Monterrey, Mexico, and Virginia Rodes from uh, Uruguay, Udelar. Yeah. And uh, so we have been trying to create this group of leaders. Uh, currently, we have nine different countries from Latin America represented in the region. And what we're trying to do is capitalize on the initiatives that the uh, individual initiatives that are working throughout the different countries that we are working with, creating synergy and collaboration between them. These are the participating countries currently. So we have Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Mexico, Nicaragua, Uruguay, and Peru. And this is uh, pretended to be like the first phase of what is happening in Latin America. So the intention initially was to um, convene leaders of the region to see what were the initiatives that they're working on and try to find collaborations between them to create a little bit more strength between the projects and maybe identify which were the projects that we needed. We gathered in person in Costa Rica at the beginning of the year and these were the four areas that we were focusing on, trying to identify the unique initiatives that each one of us had the needs that we could identify, the challenges, and the areas of collaboration. After having this meeting, these were the four areas that we are going to be focusing on, which is the state of the art and the teacher training starting as the initial projects. So now you can see on the website that we have created, that is oilatam.org, that we have started with uh, the creation of this state of the art to present what's happening in Latin America. Together with that, we identified the teacher training. Uh, we identified in our region that there's a high need to uh, train teachers and faculty about OER. So we're gathering resources that are, have been already built for the region and um, allocating them in an area where they can be easily found. So now I'm going to give the microphone to my colleagues if they want to contribute something to the conversation. Okay, thank you, Marcela. Uh, we are very happy with this uh, nodo, and we invite you to practice in different sites, for example, research, uh, training, or different projects uh, that working together for open education. Yes, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I have recently arrived. I've bit shut luck, but <laughs> um, uh, I think it's very important uh, this initiative of the Open Education Consortium because Latin America is lack of uh, uh, showing efforts. Uh, we don't have uh, um, um, initiatives that can make uh, everything, uh, everybody work together, and every country contribute for an. Uh, joint initiative, so this is very, very important for us, it's, it's, and we hope that it's going to uh, contribute to the uh, adoption of uh, OER and open education in Latin America. Uh, so everybody from the region is invited to join us. Exactly, so the purpose really was to do the presentation of letting you, you know that we, this is what we're doing. If there's anything that you can collaborate to the node and the region, we would love to hear about you. You have there our email and you're more than welcome to be part of our group. And we have a minute, if somebody has a question, just one, a minute for a question is what we've been told. Okay, if not, we will... Oh. 
Do you want to add something? Okay. Uh, Call me Ishmael. How many of you have ever read Moby Dick? Yes. Having the last name Ishmael, you hear this often. I remember when I was in secondary school, uh, my teacher said, uh, we opened up the first page and said, go ahead, Christina, read that first line for us. And I said, call me Ishmael. And they said, no, no, a little bit louder. I said, call me Ishmael. I come from the theater world. And so he said, you're in theater. Stand up and tell us really how it's said. So I said, call me Ishmael. And that has stuck with me ever since. You can also call me Christina Marie Ishmael. Um, I was named Christina with a K. I was born in 1983. My mom wanted me to be unique in 1983. She knew that I was going to be unique in this world. Marie is the maiden, or excuse me, is the middle name for my mother, my grandmother, and my great grandmother. It is a family name. Ishmael means whom God hears in Hebrew and in Arabic. That's my name because names are important. Names are important for me, names are important for you, names are important for our students. Pronouns, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. We now live in a time where we have folks that are telling us that they are no longer binary, and that they, are, they want to be identified as they, them, and theirs, and that's okay. Uh, we also have our he, him, and his, because pronouns are also really important. Lastly, we have the big eight identities, the way that we identify ourselves. This work comes from Columbus State Community College in the United States, where we identify ourselves by age, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, race or ethnicity, uh, religion or spirituality, culture, and of course, ability. So think about those things. Just give about 10 seconds. Where would you put yourself on these lists? How would you identify yourself? If I were to say, how would you identify yourself? Think about that for just a moment. Remembering that we each have our own identity is important, especially when we are in the classroom. However, when we look at the textbooks or the books that are in our schools, they're not always representative of the kids that come into our schools. I come from the US, and so I have a very US perspective on these things. In 2018 and 2019, there are 50.7 million US students in primary and secondary schools, in public schools. That breaks down to 24.1 million students that identify as white and 26.6 million students of color. Again, thinking about the materials that are in our classroom, not necessarily representative, representative of our students. If you also think about the teacher workforce, in 2017, 77% of our US teachers identified as women, cisgendered women, and 80% identified as white women. So students do not see themselves in their own teachers. Rudine Sims Bishop put out an article in 1990 where she called for windows and mirrors in instructional materials. This is a really influential quote. Um, I don't need to read all of these things, but the idea is that windows so that we can see the perspectives of others, sliding doors where we can actually step into those perspectives, and then mirrors where we see ourselves, because readers often seek the mirrors in the books or in the materials they are using. So windows, students see the perspectives of others. Mirrors, students can see themselves. What does all of this have to do with OER? We are at an open education conference. Everything. Those open licenses matter because we can choose to customize the resources that we're using. Customizing it, localizing it, making sure that our students are represented and they are see themselves. I'm a former elementary teacher. I taught English language learners in Omaha, Nebraska, right in the middle of the United States. 114 languages are recognized by my first school district. The majority of my students were Spanish speakers, but I also had several students from Togo, West Africa, from Russia, from the Ukraine. And they got to experience snow for the first time uh, when they came, but then they also got to do things like field trips. I spent many hours going and finding instructional materials online to customize and localize so that my students could see themselves in the materials. So we have the opportunity right now by using something like OER and open licensed materials to include the history of marginalized communities, to make sure that our LGBTQ students see themselves, their gender, their identity, their sexual orientation. Um, we can choose to change pronouns to they, them, and theirs if we so choose. We also have the ability to teach the history that we might not have ever learned. I never learned about the importance of Cesar Chavez until I was in high school or in secondary school in my Spanish classes. I never learned about him in any of my history classes. 
So how do we make sure that we are also um, teaching the histories that we probably didn't learn? There are some great resources um, from Teaching Tolerance that talks about this, again, coming from the US perspective, of course. We also have the ability to share the stories of those who have been silenced. Um, this is the tribal sovereignty curriculum from Washington State in the US. This is curriculum for elementary and secondary students to learn more about the native nations that exist in Washington State. It's openly licensed, so anyone can use it. Um, so it's a little piece of where we can see it in the US, um, but it's incredible to think about how they are represented in some of our classrooms now. We have the power to make our instructional materials inclusive and representative, but we need folks like you. We need different voices, not always from the global north, um, and definitely not always English speaking. Thank you so much. We have time for questions? OK. Any questions? Oh. <laughs> Christina, with the um, like the tribal, the very last slide there mm -hmm. with the tribal education in Canada, we call them uh, different names there, indigenous and. Um, but the question there is, how do you translate into their language, their first language? Because that. There's many dialects mm -hmm. and there's many languages and some have actually not even really been formally written down, etc. So any sure. ideas there? Um, so the tribal curriculum that came from Washington State uh, was a project that was led by the Washington Department of Education and it was with some teachers that were working with <laughs> elders from different tribes to do that. So I would imagine, in their case, now I, I don't know for sure, that they were able to translate the materials into their native languages. Um, but it is predominantly English based right now, um, but with the open license it could be translated without infringing copyright. So I'm not sure, um, but I think working with the tribes in that process would be really helpful. Right, and I also think it opens up this idea that not everything has to be written down, but also mm -hmm. audio files. Absolutely. Like the, the, the power of the spoken the word yeah. to revitalize languages and to teach languages that are, in many cases, being threatened to, you know, there's so Extension. few traditional mm -hmm. speakers of that. Absolutely. So I think sometimes we need to think about not just writing things down or having pictures, but also the use of the audio files. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, my question is about maybe a lack of uh, information or some resources because uh, I'm from Russia, from Tomsk State University and uh, I'm responsible for MOOCs production. So right now, these months, uh, we have like a contest for uh, anybody, for uh, students, uh, pedagogists and um, some business and we are looking for ideas what we can do uh, for, for the world, so, something useful. And maybe you feel some lack of uh, topics or something mm -hmm. and uh, you can share with us. And sure, we can so, um, so I work with many schools across the US and there are a lot of resources in math and in science, but we are missing resources in um, social sciences or social studies, as well as English language arts or learning literature and things like that. So there are more resources in math and in science, but definitely not in literature and social studies, or social sciences. 
Oh, we, we have a lot, to be honest, because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in Russian, but... <laughs> sure, we can still <laughs> so learn from that, exactly. it, yes. Yes. Uh, We are a really humanitarian university, we have a lot of uh, psychology uh, MOOCs, uh, some about identification, uh, about uh, geniuses and so something like this, so uh, we, we, we can share, it, okay. it, it will be visible. And uh, okay. I have uh, another question, yes. uh, and the second is about um, uh, so you use uh, some uh, open resources to uh, make education more individual, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, is uh, there any uh, maybe requirements uh, how to make uh, a really massive resources uh, more individual? Uh, should it be uh, wide or really narrow? So what is the balance? It's a great question. So if it is a um, primary or secondary teacher, they are trained, typically, they are trained to take something that is very wide and then they can customize it. And so it works really good if it is just something kind of general, so then the teachers can do that um, or the, the people in the school system. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Great, thank you all so much. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Paul Stacey, the Executive Director of the Open Education Consortium. I, I thought I'd do a little talk on what I think of as seeing the forest and the trees. Um, as the Executive Director of the Open Education Consortia, one of the unique things we get to do is look at open education around the world. Uh, which is a very privileged and unique position. Most others are within a country or within a region and looking at open education within that country and region. But at the Open Education Consortium, we're kind of looking at it around the entire world. And so I thought I'd, I'd talk briefly about what that view, that global view looks like and also talk about how we, we also take the opportunity to look at the trees. So both the forest and the trees. So first of all, just in case you don't know much about us, we're global, we're nonprofit, we're a member-based organization with members from uh, over 44 countries around the world. We always welcome new members. And, and when I, so I started this position maybe 18 months ago, and as I've been spending a lot of time talking to people about what it is that we do and what our value proposition is, and this is the one of the things that I keep hearing over and over again, that our biggest value proposition is that we are the kind of go-to organization for understanding open education globally. So this global perspective is one of our, our unique value propositions. And it does show up in the kind of events that we do. So this is an event that we do every year called Open Education Week. It's uh, scheduled uh, for March 2nd through 6th uh, next year. Um, but the stats you see on the screen, 6,494 participants from 123 countries and so on, is kind of typical of the kinds of uh, levels of participation and representation that take place in the events that we support. And, uh, and so uh, if you were to participate in Open Education Week, you'd be exposed to open education from these broad uh, uh, areas of the world, and you can even um, take part in activities that are in your own local language. And even this event, and this was a chart that Chrissy put up earlier this morning, you can begin to see the diversity of, of representation at this event and the way that it in, is uh, inclusive of, of more country representation, more, uh, more different uh, people from different parts of the world, although I would still say, looking at this, that it's still uh, very heavily a higher proportion of participants from North America and Europe than the rest of the world. So we still have a long way to go to, to be completely inclusive and representative, but I think it's a good start. Um, I also uh, have been finding it intriguing to look at things like this, which is a research report that came out of the Hewlett Foundation that looks at uh, the, the level of robustness of open education research in different parts of the world. Um, and so you begin to see that, again, in North America and Europe, you have a very robust level of research taking place in open education and, and a set of topics that are quite diverse and less diversity across other parts of the world. So we clearly have lots of work still to do in some of these other parts of the world. And one of the efforts that we undertook last year 
to, to look at how we can engage um, people more effectively from different parts of the world was the Open Education Leadership Summit. Some of you in the audience I know were there. Um, this was an event that we did in partnership with the International Council for Open and Distance Education as well as the two French ministries. And I see Jacques, Jacques Dang is here. Hi, Jacques. Um, and this was an attempt to kind of address not the people doing grassroots work at the front line, but instead the leaders, the people who have decision-making authority, the people who have budgets, the people who can set policy, and to begin to engage them in the strategic thinking around open education. And I just wanted to share with you some of the things that came out of this event, which I found very intriguing. Uh, one was that uh, we had everyone do roadmaps that represented a two-year roadmap of their open education initiatives going forward. And one of the things we asked them to do was to identify the value proposition and benefits of their open education initiatives. And so you can immediately begin to see that um, there's some, um, some benefits that are um, that are commonly held across all leaders from different parts of the world. So the number one benefit being access and, and inclusion, followed by cost, followed by collaboration, followed by serving underserved students, improving student learning outcomes. And I actually love that pedagogy actually is on this list. So you can imagine open education as being not only a way to improve access and lower costs, but also to innovate around pedagogy, which I think is really where the excitement is. Um, I also found it interesting that the open education roadmaps that we produced at that event uh, depicted the breadth of open education initiatives that uh, different places are engaged in. And so we primarily end up, I find, speaking a lot about open education resources, but it isn't just open education resources. It's also MOOCs. It's also open access on the research publishing side where you're releasing your research in an open access journal. Uh, and it's also open data associated with that research. And even op open source software and hardware represented uh, was on 19% of the roadmaps that got produced. So that actually was uh, an eye opener for me that the umbrella of what we're talking about when we speak about open education is quite broad. And also at that event, we, in doing the roadmap, we asked people to identify what is it that your open education initiative is producing that you could share with others. Because obviously open education is about sharing, so what is it that you're doing that you think others could benefit from? And also, what might you benefit from receiving from others? So it's kind of a two-way reciprocal exchange. And 90% of the roadmaps identified that they had things that they felt others would benefit from. And that, the other thing that we found really interesting was that day two of this event was about uh, cross, uh, was about uh, cross regional partnerships, collaborations around things that they have sh have to share or want to work on collectively. And so there were 13 different collaborative roadmaps involving not just people from within the same country or same region, but across multiple countries. So the notion that collaboration can inc can, can be global, I think is actually a critical part of this whole space. And you can see the 13, uh, 13 collaborative roadmaps that got generated. Uh, and some of them, like the nursing one, for example, has actually uh, gone on to become a real collaboration. Um, Another couple of things from the global perspective, open education really is for everyone. And so um, at the Open Education Consortium, this, this year we diversified our membership categories. We've been primarily heavily on the higher education side, but now we've broadened it to include primary and secondary, uh, non-accredited consortia, uh, cultural organizations, governments, and so on, just to be more inclusive. And um, we did a survey of our members on what it is that they would like to uh, to do as part of their membership in our organization. And these are the top four things. They want to be able to partner with each other on projects. They want to ha have uh, professional development, some learn some best practices associated with open education by engaging with others and learning from them. They want to devise policy and strategy together, and they want to engage in communication where they can ask each other questions, talk about issues, and promote their own initiatives. And I we're definitely going to um, be doing more in all four of these areas, including in the coming months, uh, the development of a OE Global Listserv so that they can begin to dialogue. Our role as a kind of member organization is to do the community building, to do convenings like this, to support at the grassroots and leadership level, uh, do a lot of advocacy and awareness, and to look at curating, communicating, and showcasing and facilitating that matchmaking between our members. 
Um, uh, we did a couple of events this past year around uh, policy. So uh, this was one that we did with um, Centrum Sofova and Spark in Warsaw, where we brought together people who were positioned to do policy initiatives around the world and then provided some guidance around how to plan their open policy and then a six month period of mentoring leading up to Open Education Week when they'll all report out. And we also ended up uh, uh, being a mentor on the Open Education for a Better World project, which was uh, a really fantastic initiative that, um, um, again, brings together open education initiatives around the world. And we've been also keen to support and have been engaged in supporting the, uh, the op Open Education Resource recommendation that UNESCO just adopted. Um, last week, we did the Open EdTech Global event in Barcelona, which looks at the education technology infrastructure slice of the open uh, education world and uh, this event was really intended to be for those players to have a, a, a place where they could speak and to begin to collaborate and define some projects and initiatives that they would work on together. There's a, an interesting Barcelona blueprint that has come out of that initiative. And just a last couple of words uh, for my remaining seconds about the trees view. I wanted to focus on the, the forest view, but, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that open education is different in different parts of the world. And so as an organization, we need to look at what are the special, unique ways at the forest level that educa open education is taking place. And uh, I'm really proud of the Open Education Awards that we give out every year. You can see the broad range of categories, and these awards go directly to individuals or specific projects or initiatives uh, at, on the ground. And um, I really encourage you to come to the awards ceremony later today. Uh, you heard about the OE LATAM node, so that's an example of us saying, yes, open education has a global umbrella, but it also has a regional focus within the Latin America area, and so how can we support what's taking place within that region, not just globally? And lastly, we have another regional node in the USA, which is focused on community colleges that has actually been in place for, a, for an extensive period of time and has uh, a really broad membership. And you can see the kind of activities that it, it's engaged in around advocacy and awareness, around um, community development, professional development, and implementation support for OER in general. So forest and trees, that's kind of the role of the Open Education Consortia, and that gives you a snapshot of the kinds of things we're up to. Well, while we're bringing up our uh, presentation here, I'd just like to say that we're going to talk about the Open ETC, that is the EdTech Co-op. And it's kind of segues perfectly with what Paul was talking about, getting identified in the roadmaps of the widening definition of open education encourages novel partnerships that knit together the different substance, tools, and capacity and often solid parts of the field. This is exactly what the Open ETC, uh, I think, uh, had at a core of its intention when we, uh, um, a number of colleagues in British Columbia started to gather, talk about our common challenges, our, co our, our, our common needs. Uh, so um, we have uh, a couple things here to... Oh, it's still, it's still coming up there. There we go. And, oh, and there it comes. Uh, it, while the uh, image is coming up, uh, we uh, started talking about some of our common needs with regards to supporting open educational practices and open pedagogy. A lot of the time in our conversations, some of these uh, constraints were based on infrastructure needs. Some large institutions had the capacity to provide the infrastructure to their educators and students, while medium and, si medium and small sized institutions struggled with the infrastructure. There was a willingness to engage in those practices and open pedagogy, but some stumbling blo blocks around the, the infrastructure. So what we started to talk about is some of these fundamental principles of of, uh, how could we all collaborate through in-kind contributions or maybe some smaller pots of money uh, and control our own tools, lower the barrier to access to engaging on the open web, provide a, a sustainable infrastructure that we all could put our hands on and all support, as well as um, provide a, a space for educators and students and learners to experience and experiment and innovate with open educational practices. So yeah, go ahead. 
Um, so uh, the, well, the, one of the first things we did in 2015, we started to identify some uh, frameworks that would allow uh, folks to self-serve. We, we'd allow um, uh, educators across uh, uh, the institutions in British Columbia to self-serve applications, single-purpose applications. Uh, this is a snapshot from a framework uh, in, uh, called Sandstorm that we had started in 2015. It was as simple as you are an instructor, you need a project management tool, you need a, a collaborative writing tool. We provide two apps, so you just use the two apps that you need. You need a chat application, we have that as well. So comp, you could mix and match different applications. Since the, uh, we started using Sandstorm, lots of other really fabulous frameworks have emerged. We're uh, currently evaluating uh, one called um, um, CloudDron, which is used as a Docker container frameworks, and we're, I think that uh, holds a lot of promise, and I think it's something that's really going to merge in, um, in a larger capacity through the open ETC. Um, another element, something that we, we talked about, is the need to push back on some other proprietary platforms that are team-based communication. So most of you have probably heard of Slack. So we started thinking, what would Slack look like if it was open source and we could share the entire framework? We identified a, um, a platform called Mattermost, which has many of the same kind of features that Slack does. And not only did it have many of the same features, but we could be really creative with the types of things that we could integrate. Uh, so um, we've uh, managed to integrate a web conferencing platform in the, um, in the tool that's called Big, Big Blue Button. Some of you may have heard of that. It makes it super easy to form a group, have a chat, and if you need to do a little face-to-face, -face, you don't need Skype, you don't need Microsoft Teams, you can bring in big blue button really, really simply. And uh, some of the really exciting stuff that's been going on is with, uh, we just did a bionic upgrade to our WordPress uh, services. Our WordPress services will allow you to uh, take an existing framework, if you will scroll back up to the, uh, the first, one of the first things we did with a clonable framework. So instead of giving people a basic WordPress uh, pl uh, platform, um, with no content in it, no instructions, no guidance on how you might use this. We take uh, a framework like a Splot, which is something that uh, Alan Levine put together to take away some of that, um, the, um, the complication of using a WordPress dashboard to create content. And so it provides a much, much easier interface and it doesn't require a login. So we take some of those stumbling blocks away and now, if we were to tell someone how to set up such a framework, it would probably be very difficult uh, for most people to do that. But so we pr provide clonable frameworks, clonable objects that have content as well as the infrastructure uh, um, um, tied to it as well, which um, um, uh, was resulted in over a thousand users using our platforms now with uh, over a thousand sites of many different varieties and uh, use cases. Okay, I've got 20 minutes of stuff and I'm going to do it in two minutes. Go! Um, so one an example of a clonable framework that we've done, for example, is a startable e-portfolio site. So rather than giving people a Hello World site, we can pre-theme it. We can set up the menus for them. We can put in prompts to give the students some idea of what is there and we can also embed teaching materials on how to use the site. And we found that this has really dramatically improved the introductory experience for WordPress for people. But even though we start them with a running start, the students can take it wherever they go. So this is an example. The student was given that starting framework and ended up building a quilt-based metaphor theme out of it. So the students can do just the minimal stuff based on the starter site, or they can make it their own, given that it's an open framework. Um, I just, I really think the clonable thing is such a powerful idea. I should note, by the way, this ability to onboard people with the portfolios has allowed us to literally onboard hundreds of students at institutions that none of us in the co-op actually belong to. We've been able to set this up and the people have been able to basically do a self-serve and successfully serve themselves. Now, we, big part of our model is we don't charge money for this, but we want a contribution back uh, here on the site. And by the way, all our materials are available. I'll go back to the link I tweeted that out earlier. Uh, in this case, we had a student from one of the institutions participated, gave us back video tutorials, and I want to, I'm just going to blast this. I just want to show one more example, though, of that. So this is like an example of a really high-end custom website we did for a deep mapping project. This would be hard to develop, and it took a good developer two weeks to do it, but we were able to create a generic version of that cultural mapping service, clonable, that anyone can use to, to culturally map 
anything. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Anne-Marie. Thank you. So I'm going to out myself. I'm not from BC. You probably can tell by the accent. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I, I work for the Aperio Software. I work for many people, but I work for the Aperio Software Foundation. I got involved with the Open ATC um, a year or so ago um, because we're all very interested in how we share best practice around open source and particularly in head tech. And so the, the things I've been working on in the, the last little while with, with these guys and with our um, co-collaborators, Tannis and Clint, has been thinking about where we go next. Because I think what you've seen in super quick time is that there is a need here. Um, this started, I think you explained to me, as kind of three or four people in different institutions having an immediate need, um, setting up a shared infrastructure to meet that need, some other people from other institutions coming in because they have the same needs. <clears throat> and now what we need to do is move that on a bit um, and move that into a, a kind of sustainable ongoing model. But this is quite new territory. I think this whole idea of shared services kind of by the sector, for the sector, is something a lot of people are, are, are looking at. Um, and I think, again, it chimed a little bit with what Paul was saying earlier. Um, so, yeah, so our next three years and thinking about road mapping that out are about how do we take what we've just demonstrated and put it onto a sustainable footing. Um, you know, so there's, there's been offers of money, there's been cold hard cash, and there's been offers in kind to get us to this point. But what kind of funding models do we need ongoing? What kind of legal entity do we need to be to give us the kinds of flexibility to take the kinds of um, money that we're being offered? Um, other things we need to do are really around the community engagement piece. A lot of what is in the Open ATC toolkit at the, open, at the moment is largely driven by the needs of the community. So how do we continue to make sure that that voice is heard? Um, and that builds out into what do the terms of service look like? Um, how do we build champions within the community? And then kind of kind of boring stuff. This is the kind of stuff I get interested in. Um, <laughs> what do we do when somebody wants a new application? So we're looking at Cloudron at the moment, as Grant said. What do we do when somebody wants something new? Does everybody get what they want? And how do we sunset old stuff? Because this is kind of the nuts and bolts of some of the sustainability stuff. So we'll continue to do conferences and presentations and tell everybody about this, because I think there is a bigger message in here about the extent to which we can support the needs of open education within the sector. We don't always have to buy. Um, and we don't always have to be reliant on vendors in this space. Um, but um, yeah, we, we want to learn from other people who are working in this space as well. So I'm going to stop talking because I think we have a little time for questions and there hopefully will be some. I just do note that we do have all of our, all of our materials are on the web there, opened.ca, OE Global 19, or you can just go to opened.ca and go to the site. We have all sorts of materials there too. And we have really cool stickers made by Brian Mathers of uh, Thinkery Visuals. I got a big box full of them. We'll have them on the sharing table, but if you see us to ask for them, we want to give them away. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. It's very pleasure. And I'm going to talk about um, experience, my experience uh, about my child, one of my child in the field of education. Uh, it's the MOOC. And let me start with MOOCs. I think uh, all of us knows what it is, but just a few words. Uh, I report here the definition from Oxford Dictionary University just because it's, it's a, a very trick to define a MOOC, but we know what the acronym means. Massive Open Online Course. And I just reported some of them. It, here are some of the uh, providers of MOOCs. Uh, we can identify and find the Coursera IDX, uh, one of the two of the main one. But also recently, uh, we have also the Chinese one and also uh, the uh, Spanish and the fund. Who knows the fund? It's the French one, of course. <laughs> and also, uh, but today I'm going to focus uh, on this one. Who knows that? Okay, <laughs> Polymi Open Knowledge, which is the Italian one, because uh, um, Politecnico di Milano uh, in 2014 decided to uh, develop and produce, uh, uh, to launch uh, this uh, platform. 
Uh, it's uh, basically it's built on uh, OpenEdX and produced by uh, METID, which is the department of Politecnico who organized these amazing uh, conferences. Uh, what is the aim of uh, uh, POC, Polyme Open Knowledge, is to bridge the gaps between two sides. For instance, from uh, high school to university. So to uh, provide uh, aid to the students who want to uh, approach university and who want to, uh, to, to bridge this gap, to fill this gap here. Uh, in 2014, was launched the, the platform with and hosted uh, three MOOCs. One of them was uh, uh, Precalculus MOOC. is a, a mathematics course for uh, uh, students who want for the transition, focus on the, on the transition of the students from high school to university. And the aim is, it's my fault here, the aim is to um, to recall and recap mathematics and prepare of, uh, to the admission test, which is called a TOL, test online. So the target is uh, uh, high school students and the first students uh, of STEM programs. And we had uh, uh, about 20,000 of students enrolled in, uh, uh, at the moment. It's not so huge for, as MOOCs, but for Italian MOOCs, uh, it's very uh, high. Uh, let me give you an ex uh, just show the, um, some materials of this uh, MOOC. Cover, the syllabus covers um, many topics of mathematics, actually high school mathematics, just to recall. And the structure of the MOOC uh, is structured in six weeks. Uh, there are lots of videos. Uh, and quizzes. This is just an example of the videos, and I, I would like just to show that because uh, it's one of the main part of the MOOC. And now let me move on the core of this conference, and let me talk about the uh, license. We decide to. Uh, to release this MOOC using the uh, a copyright, uh, the copyright uh, license. Why? Actually, because uh, it's a property of Politecnico di Milano, and actually it's just uh, thought to uh, be delivered to the student who will come in Politecnico di Milano. But actually, if we think deeply about this aspect, uh, the truth is different. We thought about this because uh, we were full, actually. Okay, why? And I just uh, tried to, uh, to explain why. Because when we la launched the, uh, the uh, pre-calculus, after a few months, we redesigned a preparatory course in our university using only the videos of the MOOC. Okay? And after a few months again, just we design a, a new project, a researcher project in math education to understand, devoted to the teacher, to understand how teachers use multimedia in their classroom. And we use just the videos here and promote the use of the videos, not the MOOC as well. And recently, in yesterday, actually, uh, we produced another MOOC that used, that embedded some videos from Precalculus. So the idea that was uh, like copyrighted is it's a limited idea. And much more, we received in these years uh, messages, comments by teachers, by colleagues, by students. The, the center one uh, by Giovanni is uh, uh, a student who write me on Facebook Tell me, uh, uh, tell me, told me that. So tell me that is um, the professor using classroom the videos, and we have no control of that. So to uh, to conclude, the idea that the MOOC is just a 
a child is just our to to uh, uh, to calder it but it's not a, a structure it's a met, it's uh, made by different pieces and in particular we observe in these years that it's composed by videos and quizzes and people use that uh, uh, teacher students use that to um, to design their learning path so they use that as open is educational resources, but they, it's not defined as open. So we decide to changing to, to turn the license from copyright to uh, CC BY uh, NC license. Thanks for your attention. Okay.